From aliens in Area 51 to the moon landings being faked, many conspiracy theories are viewed as harmless fun. But when they spill over into the mainstream and their followers reach high office, do they pose a threat to democracy? Welcome to Roundtable. And hello from me, David Foster. There was a time, perhaps, when conspiracy theories stayed mostly on the margins of public debate. But now, time and again, they make it to the mainstream. And there is even a believer in the White House. What does that matter? The moon landings were faked. One small Three shots were the CIA the killed JFK. President Bush did 9-11. Far-fetched theories of the past continue to cling on in the public consciousness, and other recent examples have spilled over from online message boards and social media into the mainstream. 33% of French voters are said to believe in a government plot to replace white people with Muslims and immigrants, a conspiracy known as the Great Replacement. That theory inspired the man accused of murdering 49 people in a terror attack on two mosques in New Zealand earlier this year. Across the Atlantic, a man was recently charged with killing an infamous New York mob boss in a murder apparently motivated by the dark web theory known as QAnon. Its followers believe President Trump is in a battle against a deep state conspiracy. Trump himself launched his political career, leading the Bertha movement, the false claim that President Obama was not born in the US. In 2018, the University of Cambridge found a direct correlation between conspiracy theories and populist politics. So at a time when many have lost trust in experts and provable facts are doubted, are conspiracy theories a threat to democracy and the rule of law? Let us get chatting. I'm very pleased to say that joining us on the line from New Zealand, we have Dr. Matthew Dentith, the teaching fellow at the University of Waikato, who's the author of The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories. With me at the round table, Professor Chris French, head of Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit at Goldsmiths, University of London. And here too, Professor Joe Luzinski, editor of Conspiracy Theories and the people who believe them and co-author of American Conspiracy Theories. So much literature out there. Finally, Dr. Daniel Jolly, Senior Lecturer in Social Psychology at Staffordshire University. So let's go to New Zealand. Uh, Matthew, you're waiting for us there. Look, nobody ever died believing that the moon landings were fake. So, so when does this go from being uh, harmless fun to funless harm? I mean, that's a very good question, because it all gets right to the very heart of what a conspiracy theory is. Many people think that conspiracy theories are weird beliefs believed by your David Icke with his theory that alien shape-shifting reptiles control the world, whilst historically and politi politically literate people in some cases will say, well, look, there was a conspiracy to engineer the verdict in the Moscow trials in the 1930s. There was, a, there was collusion by the US and the UK to create a dialogue about weapons of mass destruction for the invasion of Iraq back in 2003. There's a very open question here as to whether these theories are dangerous in some situations or... Well, somebody somewhere seems to be interrupting us. Perhaps you could speculate on the reason why and suggest that <laughs> there are forces out there operating in a way that we perhaps don't like. So let, let's move it on from what Matthew was saying uh, and go to the point that, yeah, conspiracy theories and conspiracies are two very different things, but they both involve the same foundation, don't they? That somebody was getting together to make something up in a certain way that suited them. Well, yeah, I mean, I think particularly psychologists who are interested in the kind of psychology of belief in conspiracy theories are not denying that conspiracies genuinely do happen. There's a lot, many well-documented cases of that. Um, what is of interest is the fact that can, people differ in terms of how attracted they are to conspiracy theories. Uh, to the extent that we could just sit here now and make up a completely fictional conspiracy on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, put it out there on a survey, and a percentage of people would say, yes, I believe that. Um, and, and that's kind of what's interesting. So we're not denying that conspiracies genuinely do happen. I mean, typically when people talk about conspiracy theories, they're talking about some kind of claim that as yet is unproven, 
it's probably less plausible than the kind of official explanation. It challenges the conventional it, wisdom it that, that, is, that is out there. Yeah. So when does something take on um, a life of its own, like the old Chinese whisper? Um, you know, send reinforcements, we're going to advance, is a famous one, which became, by the time it was repeated again and again, send three and four, four pence, we're going to advance. <laughs> you know, these things evolve with the telling. So when do they become mainstream, if you like, offbeat? <laughs> Well, the answer is not very often, and that's probably a good thing. So we all know the major conspiracy theories, particularly in my country, whether it's the Kennedy assassination or the idea that Obama faked his birth certificate or George Bush blew up the Twin Towers. I mean, those are the exceptions to the rule. Most conspiracy theories are here and gone. You can go onto Twitter any time at night and find some weird theory that pops up, but by sunup, it's gone and never to return. So what gives some real currency? So here's, here's what I find, is that the conspiracy theories that talk about big events or the biggest villains that everybody hates, um, that talks about things that everyone wants to understand, those are the ones um, that will carry on, like the Kennedy assassination. I mean, in the US, 80% um, of Americans believed that theory for several decades, and it still polls around 60%. I mean, that's mainstream. We've had movies, books, television shows. When the anniversary of the assassination goes by, we spend more time talking about the conspiracy theories than we do talking about the presidency. And, and the point is, you actually say theories, because I was thinking as you were talking about that, how many are there? Numerous. The, the, the main one being that it was a government or a right-wing CIA plot to get rid of a, a liberal president who was bringing down values in the United States. Correct or wrong? So, so when we ask Americans, do you believe there was a conspiracy to kill or cover up? Um, on that day, what we find is 60% still say yes. But when we ask further, say, who do you think did it? Half of that number don't know. And then smaller snippets believe it might have been Castro or the CIA or the military. Who knows? Daniel, what you find you, is I mean, most yeah, events yeah. have multiple conspiracies. That's not just one example. We've got Diana, for example, Princess Diana, Diana. Princess Diana, suggesting that she was murdered by the royal family or the government, or some suggest she faked her own death. These are all multiple contradictory conspiracies. But, but do you have a theory, not a conspiracy theory, as to why some stick and some don't? So I think very much it fits the, the, the threatening time that potentially people are in, when people are exposed to conspiracies. That event has to be large, as Joe was mentioning. Yeah. And that, that is a key ingredient. I think for the popular examples, there are large events. Because simply, if it's a minor event, it can be explained by a minor cause. So that kind of is one but key. You cannot ingredient. make it too fantastic, otherwise people will just go, "That's ridiculous." It has to be plausible. Your answer on Actually that, Daniel, plausible. and then we'll get back to. Actually, New plausible, and the conspirators have to be a tightly formed group. It has to be realistic. As to kind of think it actually could happen for it to stick. But it's quite a challenging environment, really. Where are, is the harm in a conspiracy theory? Where can it go wrong for society as a whole? I think. I mean. I mean the vast majority of conspiracy theories are in and of themselves harmless. It really doesn't make any difference whether your next door neighbour believes that the moon landings were faked or not. It's not going to have any effect on anybody else. I think the worry with believing in that conspiracy theory is that we know that the single best predictor of whether you believe in conspiracy theory X is do you believe in conspiracy theory Y, even if they're entirely unrelated. And what, what happens... So you have to be um, susceptible it does, or gullible, depending on which way you, you look again, at it. Again, I'd hesitate to use the word gullible. Susceptible, yes. I think that, that, that's more appropriate. Yeah. Um, it gets to a point where, really, with a lot of these uh, conspiracists, it's a matter of just not believing the official story, as they would refer to it. So, uh, And the danger there is that you then begin to doubt everything. You don't know what to believe. And I think that's the big worry at the moment in this era of, of fake uh, news, uh, uh, yeah. that people don't know which sources of information they can trust. It's not necessarily that they believe every single conspiracy theory that comes their way, but equally, they just don't know what but to believe. once your foundations of truth are, are rocked, then it's quite possible that you will continue to disbelieve most of what you're told, isn't it? Well, there are some people who will accept almost any conspiracy theory. And those people start to believe in things that are vast, that all events and circumstances are the product of shadowy forces operating in darkness. And imagine if you lived in that world. 
eventually you may want to fight fire with fire. You may want to take down those shadowy conspirators, not just to protect yourself, but to protect us. And we've seen too many instances of this, yeah. whether it was the Christ Church shooting, where they wanted to fight back against the white replacement theory, or Timothy McVeigh going back some time in the U.S. who blew up the Oklahoma City building, killing and wounding hundreds. More recently, in 2016, a man walked into a pizza shop to hunt down a satanic sex trafficking ring run by Hillary Clinton. Although nobody was killed, he did fire off a round, and when he was brought into court, he said, you know, Your Honor, I only wanted to save the children. And the judge's response was, well, your bullet was only four inches from somebody's brain. And now, luckily, he's in jail. Okay, I, I, let me just put this one out there, that there are therefore perhaps people out there who would deliberately invent conspiracy theories so that they can manipulate groups of people. Potentially, it could be down to us versus them mentality, where you're trying to protect your own group, where the other group is conspiring against you. The problem with that is it can actually lead to prejudice towards the other group. It can lead to negativity, discrimination. Conspiracies can be about people, such as Jewish people, where we found that those who believe that Jewish people are conspiring are more likely to have more prejudice, negativity towards them, and discriminate towards them as well. So it, conspiracies can have a wide range in consequence. It can impact our it's political behaviours, impact our climate change behaviours, impact vaccines, political violence. Recently, I found that being exposed to conspiracies can make you more likely to engage in low-level crime. Because potentially, if you believe others are conspiring, then why don't you conspire yourself? So potentially, it can be quite damaging. Of course, there are positive, positives to conspiracy theories. It opens up dialogue. We question those in authority. Those are all good things. But it can have some real negative consequences. Yeah, because a conspiracy might be deliberately stoked to get people onto your side, whereas a hoax, uh, which was what I was initially thinking about, should we compare the two, a hoax mm -hmm. is out there waiting to be discovered as a hoax. I would yeah, I th I th yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting the kind of contrast between a kind of deliberate hoax and a conspiracy, and mm. the motivations behind them, I think, are, are often very different. Um, the, I mean, the, I mean, re I mean, a recent uh, conspiracy belief that seems to have caught on quite a lot in, of late is kind of belief in flat Earth. If the Earth is really flat, then the conventional scientists of the world must be engaged in a conspiracy to, to keep that from the public. Um, and I've heard it quite convincingly argued that what happened there was that initially the people who were kind of making arguments in favour of a flat of a flat earth were actually all pretty clued up and really doing it just for a kind of intellectual game. They were seeing, well, what arguments can we put forward that do sound convincing, but then other people get involved who actually take it as literally being true. And now, of course, it's kind of becoming one of those things that's, that's spreading around. Now, again, the flat earth theory in and of itself is pretty harmless. It's not, it doesn't really matter whether people believe that or not, to, to, to some extent. Unless they sail too close to the edge. Unless they sail <laughs> too close to the edge, indeed. Uh, but it's that, it's that danger that if you believe that, then you also might buy into all these other things, okay. and they can have really, really damage. It breeds that mistrust, doesn't it, of others? Let, let, let's go round the table, and, and let's start with you, first of all, Matthew, because I think we've re-established some kind of contact, and, and ask whether you have particular conspiracy theories that you like to investigate, A, because they either amuse you, you think they're very powerful, or, or for whatever other reason uh, they interest you. In particular, do you have one? I mean, I'm particularly interested in, as I said, the Romanian situation, where you have a highly conspired society. What kind of conspiracy theories emerge in a situation where people are naturally suspicious of the kind of governments they're operating with? So, I mean, that's my particular research focus at this particular point in time, taking a kind of Eastern European perspective. Um, Daniel, what about you? Potentially anti-vaccine conspiracy theories come to mind. I think it's definitely a very topical issue with vaccines, uptake declining, and conspiracy theories and may serious, be playing, absolutely, yeah. may be playing a role in that decline. So I find it really important to understand how we can try and combat some of these conspiracy theories in the context of, for example, vaccines. Joe, you were saying that you went through Roswell, Area 51. Um, and amusingly, you saw a hotel there called the Ale Inn, Ale Inn, <laughs> et cetera. So how come that one has lasted so long? Is it because it can't be debunked? Uh, well, it can be debunked. I mean, it can't. We, we don't know that aliens don't exist. Well, you can never prove the negative, but w what we do know happened was that somebody found sticks and tinfoil out in the desert, and then 40 years later, they were able to turn that into this elaborate theory where they had alien bodies and spaceships and the government was doing experiments. And 
Um, but you can trace that back and see who was making up what when, and what we find at the end of it is sticks and tinfoil. <laughs> no aliens, no alien bodies, no spaceships. But if you were a clever alien, you'd lay a false trail, wouldn't you? You'd put down sticks and tinfoil. I mean, this is what conspiracy theorists might say. Well, it? if they fly around with Reynolds wrap, I guess, I guess that's what they do. <laughs> I'm not sure that's, that's how the aliens operate. <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask you, Chris, um, I saw you were head of the anomalistic psychology research mm -hmm. unit. Now, anomalies suggest that there are things that don't quite fit a normal pattern. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, uh, it's interesting that when you kind of open the piece, it kind of sounds a bit like ghost hunting, because my initial interest started off in kind of with respect to kind of being skeptical regarding paranormal claims yeah. and looking at the psychology behind that. And one of the interesting things is the parallels between the factors that seem to be associated with paranormal belief and conspiracy belief. And of course, some conspiracies do directly involve paranormal claims, um, but the psychology behind it seems to be seems to be very, very similar. Uh, uh, factors like um, reading meaning into situations when perhaps we shouldn't. Um, so basically, the kind of anomalies that can happen are what people focus on, particularly when a big news event is just breaking. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why some conspiracies have kind of a longer life than, than others. Okay. It's, it's particularly those very, very complex situations. So if you look at the kind of classic conspiracy theories, kind of the ones we've been talking about, kind of 9-11, um, fake it, it, moon landings, etc., there, there are so many different arguments that people put forward. And, and when you're trying to argue with a, which I don't recommend to people, <laughs> but if you try to argue with somebody who believes in these claims, you knock down one argument and they'll say, oh yes, but what about this one? And then you're not, and then what about this one? It's like trying to nail jelly to the wall. Um, and of course, the overriding factor is that any information that seems to count against the conspiracy, I mean, to take Joe's example of Roswell... Is regarded itself it's, as... It's evidence for the conspiracy. <laughs> it's been put there by the conspirators. So I it's, think... it, that's one of the things about these... In other beliefs. words, yeah. They're non-falsifiable. Uh, OK, you're involved in the psychology of this, Absolutely. Is Daniel, as well. I mean, isn't it a little bit like, perhaps, what they might suggest? Um, it's the old idea that just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean I'm not being persecuted. True. But there are many other explanations for why someone could be susceptible to conspiracy beliefs. It's us trying to understand the world around us, want to have knowledge of what is happening, want to feel safe and secure, which can make someone feel more susceptible to conspiracies. So if they feel threatened, they feel anxious, it may make the conspiratorial account kind of seem quite appealing to them. But it may not be quite satisfying because it may actually make them feel more mistrustful, as we have discussed. Things, thinking styles, so those with low, low analytical thinking are more likely to believe in conspiracies. So could it be around thinking styles? So rather than focusing on debunking a conspiracy specifically, but thinking about skill sets, thinking about media literacy, thinking about ways to build critical thinking in young people, for example, as opposed to combating specific conspiracies. Is there a demographic of, if you like, emotional and, and physical intelligence in this as well, that people who are not so bright are more likely to so be education are very bright. Has been associated, Joe's uh, and others have done some work, where education does seem to predict conspiracy beliefs, but it's not necessarily as straightforward. Some research has found that those who have more education see that complex problems are not caught, can't have simple solutions. And this seems to kind of buffer against the conspiracy, but it's quite a complicated kind of pathway. So one thing we find in the U.S. is that there is a difference between the people who believe all the conspiracy theories and the people who reject them. And that difference is that the people who believe them tend to be less wealthy, less educated, more accepting of violence against the government, more willing to conspire themselves to achieve ends, and they tend to have a whole host of, of, of psychological issues that the people at the bottom end of that scale don't have, like proneness to hallucination. Um, so... They're different people. They're different types of people. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're less educated, you're necessarily a conspiracy theorist. Um, but these are the trends across the populations. So the dangers when you have somebody at the top who believes in conspiracy theories, or at least says he believes mm -hmm. in them, because that may suit his, yeah. his political message, the dangers are what? That, well, the dangers are that people who follow what's coming from that person, um, may well kind of take it at face value, may well just believe it, and that can lead to some of the consequences that Joe's talking about, people the kind of taking so loaded so rifles. With fire, really, you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, and it also, it's, it's very kind of incredibly divisive. 
because typically this will involve, as Dan says, kind of in-groups and out-groups. The, the group that I belong to, we're, we're morally superior. Well, in fact, we're superior in every way to these out-groups that are evil and ultimately could lead to the idea, well, they must be destroyed. And, of course, the other thing is you, you cannot necessarily prove that a conspiracy theory is wrong because that in itself is a conspiracy. The conspiracy. Therefore, these people are likely to be um, remain isolated once they've decided that's where they want to so be. So that's why maybe I think thinking about skill sets, thinking about empowering people could be a way to combat conspiracy theories as opposed to debunking them one by one because you're always going to come back with another argument. There is absolutely nothing you can do about this. If people want to believe, they will believe. There are some people who want people to believe for nefarious reasons, but at the end of the day, we're stuck with them. I wouldn't be so pessimistic. I think it's a very complex problem and there, there are no easy answers. But I think that ultimately what we need to do is to try and engage particularly young people with critical thinking. It's not about telling people what to think. It's about giving them the tools to help them to make their own minds up on the basis of the best available evidence and getting in early to try to, to, to kind of make that an important thing message for them, a priority for them, rather than the kind of clickbait society that we're in, where people kind of get sucked in from one eye-catching story on the internet into another and end up going down kind of rabbit holes that can lead to all kinds of weird Conspiracy ideas. Conspiracy theories and the people who believe them. What was the main conclusion of your book? Everybody believes them. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> believes one or a few, but there are some people who believe many, many, many. Um, I, would, I would say, too, that on top of education, we need better leaders. We need leaders who are not going to try to gin up the crowd um, with conspiracy theories, who aren't going to um, accuse vulnerable groups um, the way that the American president has done, for example, saying that Mexicans are being sent to rape and murder Americans. Um, because when people see that sort of language, he's setting expectations. And if he doesn't act on that, there are going to be people out there who very well may and that would be a disaster. Everybody has a conspiracy theory they believe in. I'm going to test that. <laughs> Dan? I haven't got one that I Not I a scintilla. Believe. Not no. a tiny, tiny no. little bit. No. I just... I look at them more as research projects now. Oh, why do I someone believes in that? Well, why not? What's the consequence? So, kind of a bad answer, I know. Chris? But <laughs> I think that the, the British people were told one or two things that were maybe not true uh, as part of the Brexit <laughs> campaign. Yeah. Now, would you class that as a conspiracy theory, or would you class that as blindingly obvious? <laughs> well, 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 it's sort of strange. It's interesting. It, it's, 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 it, when you get into these complex problems, you find it's like an onion. You'll find yeah. that there's a conspiracy to spread a conspiracy theory about a conspiracy. So um, as you keep peeling this back, you find so many um, layers to it. Um, but it is absolutely true. There are often people, um, particularly in political campaigns, who are operating perhaps with you know, low moral standards who are spreading ideas that may not be true and um, attempting to manipulate people. Dan, Dan, the more you study it, he said, the, the, the more excited you become by, by what you learn. Definitely more excited so, so, about it. Yeah. yeah, so tell me some of the new things that have crossed your mind. I'm more just your thinking, mind. obviously showcasing the dangers of conspiracy theories. I'm really passionate about looking at interventions. So the things we talked about today, actually testing them, seeing do they actually work? How can this actually work in society? Because it's a big challenge and it's a challenge that we are working towards. But nothing is ever black and white. So it doesn't have to be sort of wrong if you're a conspiracy theorist as opposed to a conspiracist. Uh, you don't have to be uh, wrong if you are the person who's putting that idea out there in the first place. It, it, it's all about sort of shades of grey, isn't it? Well, it is, it is. And I, and I think, I mean, one of the aspects of people who tend to believe in conspiracies tend to be more black and white thinkers. And, and not appreciate the kind of subtleties and the greys and the complexities. Belief in this stuff, it's to some extent harmless, as I said before. The danger is that people can get sucked in and end up believing some of these really dangerous conspiracies. Uh, you know, the anti-vax movement is a kind of prime example of that, of it having something that's having real effects. But quite possibly it, it was founded in good faith. Oh, I think, I think the vast majority of the people uh, who, who believe in these conspiracies, they genuinely do believe. The people who are pushing it usually do believe in it passionately to the extent mm. that they will put their own lives at risk in, in defending those beliefs. But, um, you know, for all that, if, if actually those claims are wrong and they're damaging, we have to I try to basically defuse them. So, Joe, they're not all fruitcakes, but some of them are fruitcakes and they're dangerous ones. Yeah. I mean, I'll t tell you, my, my wife was diagnosed with cancer some number of years ago, and she went right, you know, what you do in the modern age, you go right to the Internet. 
And she started Dr. Googling. Google. Yeah, started Googling what she had. And many of the top hits were things telling her to slice onions and tape them to her wrists and feet to eat ungodly amounts of turmeric. Um, but none of these are going to do anything for you. And if you just did those sorts of treatments and eschewed real medicine, she'd be dead right now. And um, in some ways, she's lucky that she has a husband who reads the medical journals <laughs> and is at a university that has a very good cancer center. But we got all the real medicine. But there are many people who die every year because they take the phony advice that's out there. And, the and if we had enough time, we could talk about the difference between old wives' tales or new old wives' tales and conspiracy theories. We thank you very much indeed. We could have gone on talking for a great deal longer. I suppose the only thing we do know for sure is that the truth is out there somewhere, a la Area 51, perhaps. Thank you for taking part in the program. Thank you for watching from me, David Foster. Goodbye for now. Hope to see you next time.